All right, guys, today we will go ahead and start the chapter on the skeletal system. As always, you can use the objectives to help guide your studying. The skeletal system includes the skeleton, right? The bones of the skeleton, as well as all of the connective tissues um, that stabilize, cushion, and connect the bones to each other. So that includes things like cartilage. Um, the bones have a cartilage cap on the end of them and that provides a nice smooth surface so the bones can slide and glide nicely alongside each other. Um, ligaments are connective tissues that connect bone to bone, holds our bones together. So for example, at the shoulder, where your um, humerus is held in your shoulder socket, right? Held in up against your clavicle and your scapula. There are ligaments that stabilize and hold those bones together. Same thing with your knees, where your femur meets up with your tibia. There are numerous ligaments that hold those bones together and stabilize that joint. Then there are other connective tissues that are present, just providing cushioning and extra support. For example, the tissues that form the joint capsule that surrounds the joint and holds the um, synovial fluid inside. The primary functions of the skeletal system include one, providing support and structure, right, or shape for the body. Our overall stature and size and shape are dictated by our skeletal system. If your bones are long, well, you're tall. If your bones are short, you're short. If they're wide, you have a wider stature. Um, <clears throat> the bones also support all of our other tissues. Um, all of the other tissues really kind of hang on or um, you know, stay inside the bones. Our brain, for example, is inside the skull. Our lungs and our heart sit right inside the chest. Our muscles attach to our bones and they're structured um, alongside our bones. So the body provides a lot of, or the bones provide a lot of support for the body. We also store extra minerals and lipids inside our bones. Um, minerals, mainly calcium, but also phosphorus. are stored inside our bones. Calcium is what makes the bones strong, right? So calcium is important for our bones, but calcium is also important for a lot of other processes in the body. Calcium is necessary for muscle contraction. Calcium is necessary for your heart to beat appropriately. It's necessary for all sorts of different processes. And we have to have just the right amount of calcium in our blood all the time. To make sure that we do that, that we have the right amount of calcium in our blood, um, we use the bones as a storage site for extra calcium. So the bones are like a bank account for calcium. When you have a ton of extra money, you put it in the bank. And then later when you need it, you take it out of the bank, right? You don't walk around with a thousand dollars cash on you. That doesn't make sense. Um, <clears throat> so you pack it away until you need it and then you can take it out. We do this with calcium, right? So we have calcium here in the blood and we have just the right amount of calcium. When we have too much calcium, the body can take it out of the blood and pack it into the bones. Then the blood goes back down to normal and it's good. And then later, say we don't have enough calcium. Well, the calcium is not stuck in the bones. We can get it out of the bones. So that's exactly what happens. If we don't have enough calcium in the blood, we just chew up the bones a little bit and we take the calcium back out again. Okay, so the bones act as a storage site for calcium and phosphorus. We also store lipids inside our bones. Um, the center of our long bones has a long marrow cavity and um, in infants, that marrow cavity typically has red bone marrow, but in adults, it gets converted to yellow marrow, and we store excess lipids in that yellow bone marrow. Now, the red bone marrow um, is where this next function comes in. 
the skeletal system and really the bones are important in blood cell production. Now, this is the thing that happens in the red bone marrow. We find red bone marrow in our, what's called spongy bone. And that red bone marrow in spongy bone is important because again, that's where we make our blood cells. So blood cells include red blood cells that carry oxygen and carbon dioxide around the body. Um, white blood cells, those are important um, with like the immune system, right? Defending the body against bacteria and viruses. And then finally, platelets. Platelets help to stop the body from bleeding. They're important in forming blood clots. So all of those blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, are all made in the red bone marrow, which is actually housed inside our bones in the skeletal system. The skeletal system, the bones, provide a lot of protection for the body, right? There's a reason that we have bones surrounding our delicate organs. Inside our skull is our brain. So these bones completely surround and protect the brain inside because the brain's very delicate. Um, <clears throat> right behind your sternum, you have your heart. So it um, protects your heart. Around your lungs, you have your ribs forming this cage of protection. Hey, bones provide protection for the soft tissues that are underneath. Finally, the bones work together with the muscles to allow us to move our body. Now, when we think of movement, I think we, we think of muscles, right? Muscles contract and the body moves. But think about it. If all you had was a muscle right here and that muscle contracts, the muscle would just shorten. That's it. You would see a little bulge stick up right here and there would be no movement. The only reason that the body moves when this muscle contracts is because the muscle is attached to a bone. So when the muscle contracts, it pulls on the bone and the body moves. So the bones provide leverage or they act as levers that the muscles pull on and that allows us to actually have this like nice purposeful movement. We have all different types of bones in our body, um, and we can classify the bones in a couple different ways. We can classify them based on the actual organization of the bone tissue. And when we do that, we'll see that we have compact bone and spongy bone. And we'll look at both of those a little bit later. But the difference you can imagine is that in compact bone, the tissue is very compact. And in spongy bone, it's more spongy, right? It's got holes in it. We can also classify bones based on their general shape. And when we classify bones based on their general shape, we can classify the bones into one of these six shapes. Um, Studeral bones, irregular bones, short, flat, and long bones, and then sesamoid bones. And we're gonna look at examples of each of these over the next few slides. First, we'll see sutural bones. Sutural refers to the sutures. So think back to lab when we looked at the skull. Remember that the skull is actually made up of separate bones. And as we grow, um, so when we're born, they're separate from each other and there's just cartilage between them. And then as we grow, those bones fuse together. And everywhere where the separate bones fuse together, there's a little joint and we call them the sutures. So when you look at the skull along these sutures, Sometimes there's an extra little bone there, right? That's a sutural bone. Now, so they're found between the flat bones of the skull. They're typically relatively small. Um, they could be the size of like a grain of sand, so very small. They could be all the way up to the size of like a quarter. 
So they, they vary in size, but they're relatively small. And they also vary in number. So we do not all have the same number of bones because some bones are variable. You might have three sutural bones. You might have one, you might have a ton. It all depends on you. This is different. They're in different locations, right? It might be right here in you or here or here. If the little bone is somewhere along one of the sutures, then it's a sutural bone. They typically have these really like jagged edges, just like the sutures, but they're just between the flat bones of the skull. Um, irregular bones are bones that have complex shapes. Essentially, they don't fit into any of the other categories, right? They're not, um, you know, nice and flat. They're not long and thin. They're not boxy. They're weird. So they're irregular bones. They typically have a lot of processes sticking off of them. So there's stuff sticking off in all different directions. And so we can't really classify them into any of the other categories. Um, the vertebrae are perfect examples of irregular bones. Um, they have processes that stick out, that stick up, stick down, stick out to the sides. They've got processes going everywhere. They're very irregular. Um, other examples are the pelvic bones. When you think about the bones of the pelvis, they're kind of, they're curved and they're curving up here and there are little processes sticking out in every direction. Um, some of the facial bones are also um, irregular bones. So for example, the zygomatic bone is an irregular bone. Um, or some of the bones of the skull, like the sphenoid bone. Um, so the zygomatic bone is the cheekbone here. Um, the sphenoid bone, remember, um, stretches back behind the eye sockets. And it's the one that looks kind of like a butterfly. It's got the greater wings and then the little lesser wings. And it's very odd shaped. So those would be irregular bones. Short bones are short. Um, they're really kind of like square shaped. They're small and thick. Um, so they're kind of like boxy. Classic examples of short bones are the bones in the wrist and the ankle. So technically we would say the tarsal bones, right? The bones in the ankle are the tarsal bones and the bones in the wrist are the carpal bones, right? And if you look at them, you see they are relatively boxy, right? They're pretty short and stout. Their length is pretty similar to their width. Um, flat bones are flat. Uh, they're relatively thin bones and they have nice parallel surfaces. When we look at the flat bones in a little bit, we'll look at the way that they're organized and we see they're kind of like, like a sandwich. They've got this, this um, hard compact bone on either side and then this open spongy bone in the middle and it creates this perfectly kind of broad flat surface. Um, <clears throat> the flat bones typically provide a lot of protection for the underlying tissue and then they have a lot of surface area. There's all this broad area for the attachment of muscles. Flat bones are found, um, a lot of flat bones are found in the skull. So in the skull, think about the frontal bone, right, right here. Back behind that, the parietal bones are very, very flat. Um, the occipital bone in the back, they're broad, flat bones. Also the sternum, right, the breastbone is very flat. The ribs, right, flat, parallel surfaces and then the scapula as well. The majority of the surface of the scapula is broad and flat. Um, I could see getting confused with the scapula and calling it irregular because there are a lot of processes that stick off of it. But if you look at the general surface, the large flat portion of the scapula, that does have nice parallel surfaces. Long bones are long and thin. Now, long is a relative term, right? But what we mean by long is they can actually be kind of short like this, 
but their length is much greater than their width. So it sounds confusing to say there are some long bones that are short, but like the bones in your fingers and in your hands, those are long bones and they don't stretch very far, right? And they're relatively small. But when you look at their length, it's much greater than their width. If they were short bones, the length and width would be like the same. So long bones, the length is gr much greater than the width. So they're much longer than they are wide. Um, <clears throat> Really, the bones in the appendages, most of the bones in the appendages, the arms and the legs, end up being long bones. So the bones of the arms, meaning the humerus, um, the radius, the ulna, as well as the bones in the hands, so the metacarpal bones and the phalanges, those are all long bones. Um, so the, the fingers, and then the legs, the feet, and the toes as well. So in the legs, you have the humerus, the tibia, the fibula. Those are all long and thin, right? They're much longer than they are wide. And then in the feet, you have the metatarsal bones, and then all of the little bones in the toes, um, the phalanges, most of the phalanges. The last type of bone, um, if we were classifying the bones according to shape, would be a sesamoid bone. Sesamoid bones are named sesamoid because somebody thought they looked like sesame seeds. So like when you get a hamburger bun and it's got those flat little tan seeds on the top, those are sesame seeds. Um, they're small and flat. Sesamoid bones are small and flat. Um, Sesamoid bones are kind of strange. Um, they develop either um, inside a muscle or inside a tendon, like the tendon will grow around um, or be surrounding the sesamoid bone. And they're always present near joints. Now, these sesamoid bones are variable meaning different people have different numbers of these and you could have them at all different places. They're typically um, are very commonly near the joints in your hands and your feet. So where the bones come together like to form your knuckles um, or in the feet, those are very common areas to have sesamoid bones be present. There is one sesamoid bone that almost everybody has and that's the patella. The patella remembers the kneecap, right? So this bone right here that sits just on the front of the femur, that's what you're looking at. This is the femur and the upper leg, and then this is the tibia and the fibula of the lower leg. And the patella sits right here. Almost everybody has the patella, but the rest of these sesamoid bones are variable. Different people have them in different places. Now, Sesamoid bones, here you see the patella that most everybody has, right? The patella is right here. And you can see the way that it's, it's you know, formed or in conjunction with a tendon. Here we see the quadriceps tendon. That's the tendon that connects to this, this group of muscles up here in the thigh. And, um, <clears throat> and then that, that comes down and we have this, this ligament that connects to the tibia. So sesamoid bones act as like a pulley system and it allows you to generate more force and strength when a muscle contracts. So when these muscles up here in the thigh contract, they pull on this tendon and it kind of slides alongside or, or along this patella and pulls on the leg. Um, so think about a pulley, right? Like a pulley and you've got the rope that goes over it. So, and you pull on the rope, right? And you can lift something. You can lift things, um, really heavy things, a lot easier with a pulley system when you pull on the rope and it slides over that smooth surface. So that's what's happening here. The patella is like the pulley 
right? And the tendon that's gliding over it is like the rope. And that just, um, again, it allows our muscles to provide more force um, or, or do more work without as much effort involved. This is why we always have them develop at the joints, right? The joints are where we have, um, you know, muscles attached and where we'll have movement occurring. So this is where we need that force. Here, um, you can also see this is one of the variable um, sesamoid bones. This first one here is showing you um, it's at the distal end or like the distant end of the first metacarpal. So this right here is the first metacarpal. So like this bone right here in your thumb and then the, um, the proximal phalange are failing. So this is the first bone of the finger and this is like the bone of the thumb here. Um, and so you can see sesamoid bones developing there and there. That's what those two little, like, let me erase it. That's what these two little circles are. You see that shadow right there and then right there. Those are two sesamoid bones. <clears throat> so we talked about all of the different types of bones, and we are going to look at the structure of a long bone in a little bit more detail and the structure of a um, flat bone in a little bit more detail because we refer to the different parts of these bones a lot. So when we look at a long bone, remember the definition of a long bone is that the length is much greater than the width. And the examples of this were like the bones in the arms and the legs. So I'm gonna just roughly draw the femur right, which is the bone in the thigh, which is the longest bone that we have in the body. So that's fitting for a long bone. The long bones can be broken up into three um, different regions or multiple different regions. The diathesis of the long bone is the long thin shaft in the middle. So like this area here would be referred to as the diathesis, so the middle section. The diaphysis is made of a heavy outer wall of compact bone. So the whole outer portion, it, the outer circle is made out of really dense, hard, strong, compact bone. The inside is hollowed out. The inside of the diaphysis is a space called the medullary cavity or marrow cavity. The marrow cavity of long bones in infants is filled with red bone marrow. So that's where we make blood cells. But in adults, it becomes filled with yellow marrow. So that's where we end up storing fat. Now, the marrow can change. It can shift based on the body's needs. So if you had somebody who, you know, for whatever reason, um, was like severely anemic or something and they needed more blood cells, the yellow marrow could start to shift to red marrow, um, but that's an extreme circumstance. So the, the middle section here is the diaphysis. The epiphysis is the wide part at the end. Now epiphysis, like this SIS, is referring to just one. If we were talking about both of them, we would say epiphyses. So the epiphysis is this wide part at the end. So this is an epiphysis and this up here is an epiphysis. So this long bone here has two epiphyses, right? It's got two widened ends. The epiphyses are where these long bones form articulations with other bones. And an articulation is just a joint. So for example, the femur is gonna meet up with the tibia. That's a terrible tibia. <laughs> it's gonna meet up with the tibia right here. So that joint is an articulation. So the long bone gets kind of wider and it, it normally has like these rounded edges where it's gonna form a joint with another bone. These epiphyses, these widened ends, are mostly made out of 
spongy bone. Okay, so the shaft, right, the diathesis is all strong, compact bone because it's got to be able to hold up to all of the weight of the body pushing on it and we don't want it to bend out of shape. So it's got to be really, really strong. These ends are much wider, right? They're not so thin, they're much wider. So they can afford to be filled with this spongy bone. Now there typically is a very thin, thin covering of compact bone around the outside. Um, but the majority of these epiphyses are filled with spongy bone. And in this spongy bone, that's where we have the red bone marrow. Finally, the metaphysis is just like the little neck region where the other two come together, where they meet. So like this area right here, where the epiphysis meets the diathesis, that's the metaphysis. And then same thing here. So there are also two metaphyses, just where the other two regions kind of meld into each other. So it's like a transition region. Here you guys see this. Um, again, this is the femur here. You see the diathesis is this long, thin shaft region, and that's made out of a thick wall of compact bone. If you look over here, you can see this diathesis, this strong wall of compact bone on the outside, and then you can see inside is the marrow cavity that's been hollowed out, and that has the yellow bone marrow present. The epiphysis is this widened end on each side. If you look at them in detail here, you can see there's this thin layer of compact bone around the outside, right out there and out here. But inside, this is greatly made up of spongy bone spongy because it's got all of these holes or open spaces in it. And again, that area is where we have the red bone marrow. And then the metaphysis, again, is just the area where the other two meet, where we kind of mold for, or merge from one, air, from one type of bone to the other. So we looked at the structure of a long bone and now the structure of a flat bone. A flat bone again has two kind of wide parallel surfaces or two flat per, per uh, two flat surfaces. Um, the major examples here were like the flat bones of the skull, right? So the parietal bone, for example, the parietal bones right here, the frontal bone, the occipital bone, those are all flat bones. The flat bones resemble a sandwich of spongy bone in the center, sandwiched between two layers of compact bone. So the compact bone goes on the outside. It provides this nice, strong outer barrier for strength. And then on the inside, we have all of this open spongy bone. The spongy bone is referred to as the diploe, and the compact bone on the outside is referred to as the cortex. Again, the spongy bone contains a red bone marrow in the spaces between the bone, the network of bone tissue. So when you look at the spongy bone, you'll see all of these rods. Those are actual like really, really hard bone tissue. Those rods are what give the strength to the bone. All of the spaces in between, all of these like, all of these open areas in between, those are all filled with red bone marrow. And again, don't forget, what is the point of red bone marrow? That's where we make red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. When we look at bone tissue, right? So like the tissue itself, we saw epithelial tissue, we saw connective tissue, and this is bone tissue. And each of the tissues have their own 
characteristics, right? Their own types of cells, types of proteins, types of membranes. So we'll spend some time talking about bone tissue itself or osseous tissue. Bone tissue is covered by membranes. There is a membrane that surrounds the outside of the bone tissue to separate it from the surroundings. And there's a membrane that lines the inside of bone tissue. The outside of bones are completely enclosed by a membrane called the periosteum. Okay, peri means around. Okay, osteo means bone. So periosteum is the layer around the bone. Now, all the surface, the outer surfaces of the bones are covered in a periosteum except the ends that are enclosed in a joint capsule. Okay, so the outside, so like this bone right here, this is the periosteum, this membrane that you see they're peeling back off the outside. Okay, the periosteum covers the whole outer portions of this bone except this little end right here and then at the top as well those ends where the bones come together to form a joint those ends are not covered by the periosteum okay those ends get enclosed in a joint capsule and that has its complete you know its own special features the periosteum that surrounds the outside of the bones is double layered it consists of an outer fibrous layer this is just strong proteins and um, fibers that make it it's strong to separate the bone from the tissue around it. And then there's an inner cellular layer. That cellular layer has stem cells in it. And those stem cells can divide to replace cells in the actual bone tissue as needed. Okay, so the outside of this is really, really strong and protective. And then on the inside of it, there's little stem cells that can repair the bone tissue. Bone is a specialized type of connective tissue. And when we talked about connective tissue, remember that connective tissue has cells that are scattered around in an extracellular matrix. It's not like epithelial tissue. Remember, epithelial tissue has like cell after cell after cell, and the cells are all jam-packed together, and there's not anything outside of them, right? There's no extracellular stuff. Connective tissue is different. Connective tissue has the cells scattered around, right? They're not necessarily touching each other. And then there's some sort of matrix outside and the matrix typically contains proteins, right? And then something else. And the matrix can be liquid. It can be like gel. But in this case, the matrix is dense. It's very, very hard and dense because obviously the bones are hard and dense. When we look at bone, we see that it's mostly extracellular matrix. Only about 2% of bone mass is the cells. So that means 98% of bone mass is this extracellular matrix, this dense packed in stuff that surrounds the cells, that's outside the cells. This matrix that's present in bone contains about one third collagen. So collagen is the protein fiber that's present and the collagen creates kind of like a meshwork, like a, a substructure for the rest of the matrix. And then the matrix is two thirds or mostly calcium salts. So the calcium salts, hard like salt crystals, get packed into this collagen substructure and it creates this very, very strong matrix that surrounds the cells. That's why your bones are so strong, because of all of these calcium salts that are packed into them. Now, the calcium salts, um, there's all different types of calcium salts. 
there's calcium phosphate. So this is why we say that phosphate is also stored in the bones. Um, there's calcium hydroxide. There's different types of calcium. Um, and what happens is all of these salts get combined to form this special substance called hydroxyapatite. Um, and the hydroxyapatite and various other salt, calcium salts, get packed into the bone matrix to make it hard and strong. Um, again, I said that less than 2% of the overall mass of your bones are cells, but there are cells present. And the cells are important because those are the things that actually make the matrix. So um, there's not very many cells, but they're absolutely necessary. Without the cells, that dense matrix will start to disappear and go away. So, excuse me. So um, the, the major type of cell that we'll see is called the osteocyte. Ocyte, you guys know, means cell. And I just told you that osteo means bone. So osteocyte literally means bone cell. These aren't the only kind of cell that we see in bone, but they're the most common. These are the mature bone cells. And we see that they live in something called a lacuna. Lacuna literally translates to little lake. It's a Hawaiian word for little lake. Um, <clears throat> the lacuna is just a little space that the cell lives in. So the osteocyte, if you look at this picture up here, the osteocyte is this like yellow thing. And then the little pink like area around it is the lacuna. Okay, so just a little bit of space around the cell is the lacuna. Um, besides that, the cell, the osteocytes, are completely surrounded by bone matrix. Okay, so if you look here, this is the bone matrix, and you can see it completely surrounds the cells, except for that tiny little lacuna or tiny little space that's present. The other types of bone cells that we're going to see are not in these lacuna. Hey, there are three other types of bone cells that are in other areas. The osteocyte is the only bone cell that's present inside the lacuna. Here you see the different types of bone cells that are present. Again, bone cells only make up about 2% of bone mass. So um, they don't make up a lot of the bone, but they're very important in the bone. Bone contains four types of cells. Osteocytes, which I just told you were the mature bone cells, osteoblasts, osteoprogenitor cells, and osteoclasts. The next few slides after this go through the different types of bone cells in detail, but I'll just mention them here on this slide first. Um, pay attention here to where the cell is coming from. Um, Again, osteocytes are the only ones that come from the center of bone. They're the only ones that are here in the center area where they're completely surrounded by bone matrix. All of the other three types of cells are located at a surface. They can be on the outer surface of the bone out here, or they can be on an inner surface, but they're on some sort of a surface meaning they are not completely surrounded by matrix. Okay, osteocytes are the only ones that are in the center completely surrounded. So osteocytes are mature bone cells. Again, they're the ones that are surrounded by matrix, so they live inside a lacuna. And the job of the osteocyte is to maintain the bone matrix that surrounds him. So this osteocyte does two things in order to maintain this matrix. One, he breaks it down. So the osteocyte will, will dissolve all of this bone matrix that surrounds it, will destroy it. And then he'll rebuild it. He relays down new matrix. And that makes the matrix healthy, right? It keeps it up to date and strong. Think about anything we build. If you built a house and then you never touched it again, you never did anything. You didn't clean it, no upkeep, no remodeling, nothing. 
that house would get destroyed. Right? Nothing stays good forever without upkeep. So the osteocyte performs upkeep, or we call it remodeling, on the matrix that surrounds it. Okay, again, it does that by first breaking down. So it breaks down and builds the bone matrix. Osteocytes are the only ones that do both. Okay, that's important. Other cells can build it, other cells can break it down, but there's no other cell that can do both. Osteoblasts are um, immature bone cells. This term blast is like baby cell. I always think blast baby. So osteoblasts are like baby osteocytes, right? They're immature bone cells. We'll see that happen a lot. We'll see blast added on to the end of a cell if it's immature. Osteoblasts, again, are located at the surfaces of the bone. So they can be present out here, for example, on the outer surface of the bone. Um, <clears throat> osteoblasts secrete the organic components of the bone matrix. They secrete something called osteoid. Um, that's like laying down all of the collagen. And then soon that collagen gets packed with calcium and becomes bone. So osteoblasts do like the first few steps in building the bone. So you can think of them as builders, right? The osteoblasts build bone. And as they do that, they pack calcium away into the bone. Now that's important, right? Because remember we said we have to be able to put calcium into our bones and when we have too much, and we have to be able to take calcium out of the bones when we don't have enough. So blasts, those are the ones that build the bone to put the calcium in there, right? To put the calcium away into the bank account. Now, if these osteoblasts are building bone, right, eventually they build enough bone to where they surround themselves. Then they're trapped, right? They're trapped in their own little lacuna and that stimulates they're maturing, right? That makes them turn into osteocytes because they're immature bone cells. Eventually they mature. That happens once they build enough bone to trap themselves, to surround themselves. Then they become osteocytes. Osteoprogenitor cells are stem cells. Stem cells are cells that, um, they're like the reproduction cells. They divide and replenish other cells. So osteoprogenitor cells divide to produce osteoblasts. Um, they're also located at some sort of a surface. So here we have a surface inside of the bone. Notice over here you've got an osteocyte, right? You've got all this bone matrix here, and then this is the open area inside the bone. That's the medullary cavity. So an osteoprogenitor cell is right here by the medullary cavity. It happens to be part of another membrane called the endosteum. That's a membrane that lines the inside of bone. We also have osteoprogenitor cells in the periosteum, remember, which is the membrane on the outside of bones. Okay, so you see that these three cells are related to each other, right? The osteoprogenitor cell will divide and make an osteoblast. The osteoblast builds the bone. Eventually, he finds that he's built enough bone to surround himself, right? And then he's trapped in a lacuna and he matures into an osteocyte. So that's like the, the, the cell line, right? The lineage, progenitor, blast, site. This last type of cell over here, the osteoclast, completely different. They come from completely different stem cells. They're just not related to these cells. Osteoclasts are these really big cells that secrete acids and enzymes that chew things up. They're also on a surface, 
right? So if you look here, again, you've got your matrix and your osteocytes and then your medullary cavity. So this is lining an open area. You have this osteoclast. This osteoclast has the little arms here and it's releasing all these acids and it's chewing up the bone. So it dissolves this bone matrix right here. It gets rid of all that collagen, breaks it down, and then the calcium gets released. So osteoclasts dissolve the bone matrix, releasing calcium. That's how we get the calcium out of the bank. When we don't have enough calcium in the blood and we need some, we need to pull it out of our bones. Well, the osteoclasts do that. They'll chew up all of that substructure in the bone and that will free up the calcium and allow it to enter into the bloodstream. All right, so you should be familiar with each of these four types of bone, or I mean, each of these four types of bone cells, but we're just gonna kind of walk our way through them one more time um, so you're really comfortable with each of them. Osteocytes, right? Bone cells. These are mature bone cells that live in a lacuna. They're between lamella, lamella means layers, so they're between layers of bone matrix, meaning they're completely surrounded by bone matrix. Um, <clears throat> they do connect to each other through cytoplasmic extensions. So they have like these tiny little arms, these tiny little like octopus arms of cytoplasm that reach out towards each other so that they can communicate with each other. Um, the little channels that they use to, to put their arms through are called canaliculi. So like if I have an osteocyte here and I have an osteocyte here, and we said they're completely surrounded by bone matrix, right? There's all of this dense strong matrix here. Well, the cells still need to be able to like get stuff in and out and communicate with each other and whatnot. So there are these tiny little channels that go through here, little open channels and the cells can reach out and communicate to each other through those channels. The channels are canaliculi. The major functions of osteocytes. Um, the most important thing is to maintain their surrounding bone matrix. They do this by breaking down, breaking and rebuilding. The matrix. They can also help repair damaged bone. So if a bone breaks, well, the osteocyte obviously will start to rebuild the bone matrix in that broken area um, and will help rebuild it. This overall process of degrading the bone tissue and then rebuilding it with new materials is called bone turnover or bone remodeling. And it's absolutely essential that this happens for the bones to stay strong. Osteoblasts, we said blasts are baby cells. So these are baby bone cells. They are immature bone cells um, that are eventually going to become osteocytes. While they are osteoblasts, their job is to just secrete the matrix compounds. Now, technically, osteoblasts don't make solid bone tissue. Um, what they make is something called osteoid. Osteoid literally means resembles bone because it's not calcified bone tissue yet, but it looks like bone. Um, it's almost bone this osteoid uh, ends up getting calcium packed into it and then it becomes bone tissue. But to be technical, the osteoblasts make the organic components only. So like the collagen structure, and then that turns into bone once it gets calcium in it. Um, osteoblasts again, eventually become osteocytes. 
they start to secrete the matrix and once they surround themselves with bone, then they release little chemicals that make them mature into osteocytes. Once they're osteocytes, then they can do both functions. They can break the bone down and rebuild the bone. But while they're blasts, all they can do is build the bone. So blasts, build the bone. Can you match up your beats? Blasts build bone. Um, also, remember when they build bone, calcium gets packed into the bones. Osteoprogenitor cells are stem cells. When these stem cells divide, they produce osteoblasts. They're located again in the, um, at the surfaces of the bone. So they're in that inner cellular layer of the periosteum. Remember the periosteum surrounds the outside of our bone? Well, there are osteoprogenitor cells in it. And they're also in the endosteum. The endosteum is a membrane lining the inside of bones, the inner surfaces of bones. There are also osteoprogenitor cells in the endosteum. These osteoprogenitor cells help to maintain osteoblast populations. Remember, we said that the blasts end up becoming osteocytes, so we always need to replace them, right? We need new blasts. The osteoprogenitor cells are, are what give us that, right? So if a blast matures into an osteocyte, well, the progenitor cell has to divide to make us a new blast. They're also important in fracture repair. If we fracture a bone, we have a large area where we need a lot more bone tissue to be made. So the progenitor cells will divide rapidly to make new cells to put there to start laying down new bone to repair the fracture. Finally, osteoclasts. These are the weird ones. Um, osteoclasts are really big, multinucleate cells that secrete acids and protein digesting enzymes. So they make all this stuff that dissolves the bone, right? It eats up the bone tissue, it dissolves the collagen. And as it does that, it releases the stored minerals. So it releases calcium and phosphate from the bone, allowing them to enter back into the bloodstream in the body, right? So this maintains blood concentrations of calcium and phosphate. Um, <clears throat> these osteoclasts, I told you guys, are from a completely different cell line. They actually come from the same stem cells that produce macrophages. Macrophages are immune system cells that are kind of like Pac-Man. They travel around eating anything odd that shouldn't be in the body. And then when they take it in, they dissolve it. So you can kind of see the similarity, right? They both produce these nasty substances that dissolve things. Um, <clears throat> multinucleate means many nuclei. Most cells have one nucleus. Um, but osteoclasts have a bunch of nuclei, and that allows them to make proteins um, and enzymes faster, right? Remember that the nucleus has DNA, and that DNA has a recipe to make a protein. So if I have 10 nuclei, I have 10 copies of that recipe, so I can take, make 10 times as much. Um, so osteoclasts, because they have multiple nuclei, they're really good at making these enzymes um, that digest the bone matrix. This process of, of breaking down the bone and releasing the minerals is called osteolysis, right? Osteobone, and we've used this term lice already. To lice something is to break it apart. So osteolysis is literally breaking the bone tissue apart. So we know that osteocytes, the mature bone cells, they just maintain their own little area, right? And that's kind of like its own thing. They're always just maintaining the area that surrounds them. They break it down and they build it. They break it down and they build it. And that's great. 
Then we have these other two cells, the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts that have opposite activities, right? They're both at the surfaces of the bone and one of them's chewing the bone up and the other one's building the bone down or breaking the bone down, <laughs> building it up. Sorry, one is chewing the bone, right? Destroying it. And the other one is building it and making it stronger. Those two things have to balance. There has to be some homeostasis or some balance between the osteoblasts that build the bone and the osteoclasts that destroy the bone. If they're not balanced, then the bones are going to change in some way, right? They're either going to become stronger or they're going to become weaker. If there's more breakdown than building, so if the osteoclasts are more active than the blasts, then the bones are going to be getting chewed up and they're going to lose density over time and they're going to become weak. This can happen in a lot of different situations, but one kind of common thing is immobility, right? Immobility, if we're not up and moving around and carrying our body weight around, then it leads to a reduction in bone mass. The reason for this is that weight bearing exercise, right? Actually stressing your bones out stimulates the osteoblasts to build the bone. So if you're not stressing your bones, they think, well, why am I wasting my time? I don't need to be this strong and the blasts stop building. So immobility leads to a reduction in bone mass. If there's more building than breakdown, so if the blasts are building bone more than the clasts are breaking it down, well, then your bones become stronger and denser. Again, weight-bearing exercise does this. This is why we encourage elderly people who are more prone to osteoporosis to exercise. And by weight-bearing, that just means bearing your own weight, like carrying your own body weight. So not riding a bicycle, not sitting in a chair and picking up something, but actually carrying your own body weight. You don't have to be lifting weights. It's just the own weight of your body on your bones. Again, stimulates the osteoblasts. They build more bone and that makes the bones more dense and strong. Osteoblasts and osteoclasts have to balance in order for the bones to remain, um, you know, a certain density to not get stronger or weaker. But we also look at the activity of osteoblasts and osteoclasts in relation to calcium homeostasis. Remember, we said that the bones act as a storage reservoir for minerals. The most important of those is calcium. So um, we use them as a storage site for extra calcium. It is very important that our serum calcium levels be kept homeostatic. If we don't have just the right amount of calcium in the blood, the muscles don't work right, the neurons don't work right, the heart doesn't work right. So it's very important that we have serum calcium homeostasis. Serum means blood. Again, the bone matrix is a very important part of this because that's the place where we store calcium. During hypocalcemia, hypo means below, so below normal, calcium, right, below normal calcium. So when calcium in the blood is low, when we don't have enough calcium, so low blood calcium, we need to take it out of the bones. All right, if I don't have enough money, I'm gonna go get it out of the bank. If we don't have enough calcium in the blood, well, we go get it out of the bones. So during hypocalcemia, calcium gets removed from the bones. The hormone that we rely on to do that is called parathyroid hormone. Now, parathyroid hormone then stimulates the release of calcium from the bones. If we're going to, um, get calcium out of the bones, 
we want to stimulate the breakdown and inhibit the formation of new bone, right? So for parathyroid hormone, it's going to go to the bones and it's going to stop osteoblasts. We don't want them to keep building the bone because that's going to put more calcium in there. And we want to stimulate osteoclasts, right? So allow the osteoclasts to take the bone away and stop the blasts from building it. Now, during hypercalcemia, hypercalcemia is the opposite. Hyper means above normal. So hypercalcemia is above normal calcium. That's high blood calcium. If we have high blood calcium, we need to pack it away, right? We need to put it away for later. So we want to pack it into the bones. So during hypercalcemia, calcium gets packed into the bone tissue. Calcitonin is the hormone that we rely on to do this. Okay, so calcitonin stimulates the deposition of calcium into the bones. So we want to allow the osteoblasts to pack the calcium away and stop the clasts from releasing it. The way that I remember the difference in these two hormones, parathyroid hormone versus calcitonin, calcitonin, it says calciton, right? Calciton in, we have a ton of calcium in here a ton of calcitonin. When you have a ton of calcium, you've got too much, calcitonin gets released. <clears throat> okay, so um, I think we'll actually talk about that a bit at the very end of the chapter as well. And you guys will see that um, the kidneys are involved too. So um, like when we have too much calcium, we pack it into the bones and we put it in the urine. We try and get rid of it in the urine as well. Uh, but I'm more worried about you focusing on the bone part right now, since what we're studying is uh, the skeletal system. We'll worry about the other part later. But again, I'll, I think I talk about it again at the, the end of part two. Okay, so now we're going to look at the two different types of bone tissue, compact bone and spongy bone. Compact bone is a really strong bone that pro provides protection and support for the body and for underlying tissues, right? It is very, very dense because it's so compactly packed together. Um, it's so dense that it's, it makes it strong and it's able to resist compression, even under the force of hundreds of pounds of weight from our bodies. So like the long, the long bones and the legs, they're relatively thin and we've got hundreds of pounds pushing down on them, but they remain straight, right? They don't bow out, they don't squish and compress, they are strong because they're made out of that, that strong compact bone in the shaft. Looking at the structure of compact bone, we see that the basic functional unit is called the osteon. What I mean by that is that compact bone is made out of a bunch of osteons. So you'll see osteon, 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 and that's the way that the compact bone is organized. It's organized into osteons. I'm going to talk you kind of through an osteon and then I'll show you the picture and I think the picture will help a lot. But in an osteon there's a central canal that goes up the middle like this and that central canal is for blood vessels that are going to travel you know up through the bone tissue. Then there's also perforating canals that go sideways like this again, to take blood vessels all throughout the bone tissue. Then we see that the, the bone matrix and the cells get organized in layers, these concentric layers that go around that central canal. So <clears throat> osteocytes, our bone cells, 
again, they exist in these little, like, these layers, these concentric layers around the central canal. And they're surrounded by bone matrix, right? So there's bone matrix, and then there's another layer of bone matrix, and then there's another layer of bone matrix. Hey, okay, this is 3D. So you'll see these, these concentric layers of matrix. Again, a layer is lamella. So there are concentric lamella that go around the central canal. Concentric circles are just like a circle within a circle within a circle. Those are concentric circles. So you'll see that there's matrix and then a layer of cells. Matrix and then a layer of cells. Matrix and then a layer of cells. Those are concentric lamella, concentric layers that are all going around this central canal where there are blood vessels. All right, here you guys see what we just talked about. Um, first off, this in the middle, that's spongy bone. We're not talking about that yet. Don't worry about that. What we're talking about is this compact bone out here. You'll notice that it doesn't have open spaces, right? The spongy bone's got these open spaces. Compact bone doesn't. It's really, really dense with matrix. Again, it's made up of osteons. So like this circle unit is an osteon. Then right next to it, that's an osteon. This is an osteon, right? There's a bunch of osteons all packed together. Each osteon has a central canal and perforating canals. And those are for blood vessels to travel through the bone matrix. It's very dense. So blood vessels aren't gonna just go through wherever, they need a pathway. They pa the pathway is through these central canals and perforating canals. Then you'll see that the actual, the cells and the bone matrix are arranged, radiating out from that central canal in concentric lamella. Right, so you've got like your cell inside a little lacuna, a cell and a lacuna, cell and a lacuna, and then it's completely surrounded by matrix. Now you'll notice that out here, around the very outside of the bone, this would stretch all the way around the whole outside of the shaft of the bone. There are a few other like really big layers. Those are called circumferential lamella. Okay, so the circumferential lamella go around the whole bone. The concentric lamella are smaller little ones that are inside the osteons. Um, all of these tiny little lines that you see, right? Like these little, they look like little cracks almost. Those little itty bitty lines, those are the canaliculi, the tiny little channels where the cells can communicate with each other. Um, the only other thing are the membranes. The periosteum remembers the membrane that goes along the very outside of the bone. And then lining all of the inner surfaces is the endosteum. So like lining the central canal and the perforating canal, there's an endosteum. That's an inner open area. Um, lining all of the spongy bone that's an endosteum. It's lining all these open areas. Okay. And then again, if there was a whole open cavity in the middle of the bone, that would be lined with the endosteum. That's compact bone. Really, really dense. Not a lot of open spaces. Spongy bone is less compact. And it's made up of struts of bone tissue or rods of bone tissue that are oriented in all different directions. Um, it has a lot of open spaces. It looks like a sponge, right? Like if you, like a real sponge that you pull out of the ocean, it's got a lot of open areas and little holes in it. That's what spongy bone looks like. Um, it has those rods of bone tissue going in all different directions because that allows it to resist stress from many different directions. If they were all organized in the same way, it would be really strong that way, really weak, um, going perpendicular to that. 
but because the bone struts go in all different directions, it's strong from all different directions. Now, compact bone is stronger, obviously, um, but we can't have every bit of our bone be compact. And the reason for that is that the skeleton would be so heavy, we wouldn't be able to move. Um, so spongy bone makes the bones lighter. It also provides a location for the bone marrow and the rods of bone tissue surround and protect the bone marrow. Again, when we look at the structure of spongy bone, it's not um, really dense um, layers of matrix everywhere. Instead, the matrix forms an open network of trabeculae. The trabeculae are like the little rods of bone tissue that are all interconnected with each other. Now, when you look at the trabeculae, you'll notice that they have no blood vessels present in them. So that means there's no central canal, there's no perpendicular canals, um, like we saw in compact bone. Um, the, the rods of bone tissue are so small, there's no room for a canal in the middle. There's no need for a canal. Again, the spaces between the trabeculae are filled with red bone marrow, and that's where we form our blood cells. Red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Now this, this um, red bone marrow also supplies nutrients to the osteocytes that are present in those um, rods of bone tissue. Remember, they don't have blood vessels, but there are still living cells in there. So they need nutrients and oxygen to diffuse to them somehow. The way that those nutrients and oxygen get to the bone cells is from the red bone marrow. Here you see, um, this is the epiphysis. Right, the expanded end of a long bone, and it's made up of mostly spongy bone tissue. Um, spongy bone tissue, again, has a lot of holes in it. So these rods, these are the rods of bone tissue. These are called trabeculae. If you cut one open and looked at it, this is what you would see. So there's little lamella, right? There's a couple little like concentric lamella of bone tissue. Um, and there's osteocytes, right, surrounded by bone tissue, and that's it. There's no big canal of blood vessels or, or anything like that. It's, it's relatively simple. Um, it is surrounded by an endosteum, right? Remember, that's the membrane that covers the surfaces, the inner surfaces. So all of this is covered with the endosteum. And then you'll notice all of these little holes these are showing you the openings to the canaliculi. So the, and then these little cracked lines are showing you the, the canaliculi, the little tiny channels that are present. And that's how, you know, there's, there's red marrow in here and that red marrow has blood supply. It has oxygen and glucose. So all of that good stuff will enter into these little holes and it'll travel through the canaliculi to get to the cells since so there aren't any vessels inside these um, trabeculae, inside this, this bone tissue. Again, we mentioned that bone is covered with membranes, the periosteum and the endosteum. Um, the periosteum is on the outside of bone, covering all of the outer surfaces except the parts enclosed in joint capsules. So except the very ends where it forms joints with another bone. And again, we mentioned that this is a double layer membrane. The periosteum has an outer strong fibrous layer and then an inner cellular layer that has um, osteoprogenitor cells, osteoblasts, and osteoclasts. Perforating fibers refer to collagen fibers of the periosteum. So this outer fibrous layer that's got a bunch of collagen fibers, the collagen fibers will actually connect with and overlap with the collagen fibers that are in the bone matrix. Um, and then they'll also overlap with and connect with the collagen fibers that are in the tendons and ligaments that connect to bone. So um, the, the periosteum kind of provides like a melting point 
between the bone and the tendon or the ligament. And because they all kind of overlap each other, as the bone grows, it'll kind of grow over the tendon or over the ligament. And that provides for a very, very strong attachment where the tendon connects a muscle to the bone or where the ligaments connect bone to bone, they almost never rip out. Now, like the ligament can tear, like in sports injuries, ligaments tear, but that's the center of the ligament ripping. It's not the ligament ripping out of the bone. Um, the tendon will normally rupture before it will rip out of the bone. Same thing with ligaments. So the outside of bone is covered with the periosteum. The inside of the bone is covered with the endosteum. Endo means within, osteo means bone. So the endosteum is the membrane within the bone. Now this one is not really strong like the periosteum is. The periosteum has that strong fibrous layer. The endosteum is not like that, it's really delicate. It's an incomplete cellular layer, so a thin layer of cells that lines all of the open areas inside the bone. So the medullary cavity or marrow cavity that's in the center of the long bones, it covers the trabeculae or rods of bone tissue and spongy bone. It lines the central canals and the perforating canals of compact bone. Um, and again, this is just a cellular layer. It contains osteoblasts, clasts, and progenitor cells. Um, and it's active in bone growth and repair, as well as calcium homeostasis. Oh, I just made it on time, guys. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and comment or shoot me an email. And um, Part two of the skeletal system is already up right now. So if you're feeling ambitious, you can go ahead and tackle it, um, but you don't need to get to it until tomorrow. All right. Thanks, guys. Happy Monday. I hope you had a good weekend and I will see you guys tomorrow.